Life Audio. Today we have a Friends and Family Friday where I invited my friend Natalie Runyon onto the show to talk about church hurt and all of the pain that comes with it. She has a ministry that is specifically dedicated to this very thing. And in my own past and in my own work with women, I've realized how much this is something that affects us, but we don't talk about it. And I'm a firm believer that God wants us to talk about things. He wants to reveal things so he can heal them. I pray this conversation blesses you. Stay tuned. The roof was completely gone. All of our memories being wiped away. The rain is what got 20 minutes of sheer terror. And you can feel it in your body. I watched the fire move down the canyon. The rumbling of the house. My son started screaming, we're going to die, we're going to die. In the name of Jesus, we are not going to die. At Samaritan's Purse, we bring spiritual and physical aid to hurting people around the world. We go into dangerous situations because in disaster, in disease, in war, Jesus calls us to love our neighbor, to heal the sick, feed the hungry, restore the broken. All who work and volunteer with Samaritan's Purse follow the example of Jesus. We go to serve, not to be served. And we go in Jesus' name. Join us at SamaritansPurse.org. That's SamaritansPurse.org. When you're drinking a frozen beverage from McDonald's, your brain may not like how refreshingly cold it is, but the rest of your body, oh yes, it's going to relish every moment of it because there are drinks. Then there are drinks from McDonald's. Get all the chill you need for just $1.69 from any size frozen drink like a frozen Fanta Blue Raspberry to a new ice cold lemonade. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what he says in his word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with Him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Hearing Jesus podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. And today we have a special family and friends episode for you, where I've invited my friend Natalie Runyon on to come and just talk about this message that God has burdened her heart with recently. And um, Natalie, welcome to the show. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for having me. So I thought, Natalie, it would be good to start with maybe just having you introduce yourself briefly to any of the listeners that aren't familiar with you and your ministry and your work, and then maybe just kind of talk about what God's been doing in your heart and um, the book that, that you just wrote that's coming out this summer and just kind of share with us what God's been doing. Well, it's just always such a joy to be with other women and just to sit in the presence of God and, and share our testimonies, which we know um, are just so powerful in the family of God. And I'm a pastor's kid, um, became a pastor, tried really hard not to be in ministry after being a pastor's kid, uh, grew up in Cincinnati in um, a very Pentecostal church environment, um, and really fell in love with the church. My dad was not the traditional pastor. He had been a drug addict and alcoholic prior to finding Jesus, and then really raised us in soup kitchens and homeless shelters and prisons and nursing homes and we fell so in love with the people of God that I couldn't deny that I loved church. And so that's kind of what I've carried with me my whole life. I got married um, about 16 years ago. My husband, Tony, and I have two daughters who are 10 and 14. And we actually live in Colorado right now, but our house is on the market and we're moving back to the Midwest. We're moving back to Kentucky in about two weeks and really just have spent the last 20 years of my adult life 
trying to figure out this ministry thing, trying to figure out this Jesus thing, um, how to be in church and to be a pastor's kid and then in ministry myself. And I'll tell you every day, it's a little bit of um, just navigating unknown waters. And so I'm 43 and still asking the Lord, are you sure you don't want me to be a Starbucks barista? I'll totally go work at Starbucks if you don't want me to do this ministry thing. Um, yeah, love vintage clothing, love uh, going thrift shopping in every city that I'm in. And now the book is coming out, um, which is just a product of the last 20 years of asking the Lord, why are you asking me to stay in something that can sometimes feel so painful and so hard and difficult? And that's where this book meets me is my own uh, wandering and wondering and wrestling with Jesus in the church. You know, it's, this is a hard conversation to have because I feel like um, in the last couple of years, I have, since I've gone through my own situation, I call it my season of hiddenness that after I stepped down from local church ministry, I did transition to mission work, but leaving the local church for me, um, you know, I went through a season of just church hurt that turned into this huge transition in my life. And I have heard so many stories of women that are right on that cusp of trying to decide not just do I walk away from my ministry role, but do I walk away from the church in general? You know, and I think in a post pandemic world, church looks drastically different for, for a lot of people than it did even just a couple of years ago. And so, you know, you, your, your tagline on the book is uh, persevering in ministry when you have a million reasons to walk away. And it's a sad reality that because we work with people, there sometimes are a million reasons to walk away and, and ministry is not easy. I think, you know, very sharing your opinion on that. When, when young women say to me, oh, I really want to go into ministry. I sometimes say like, is there anything else you can do? Because I know for me that if there was, if there wasn't a call on my life, if there was anything else I could do, I would do that thing. And I can't walk away because it's the call of God on my life. Now that, that looks different. The assignment has changed over the last couple of years, but um, I think that is the reality for a lot of us in ministry and the temptation to walk away is so great, especially when you, when you've been hurt, you know, there's a couple different talk topics that you talk about in the book. And I, I like how you, you were talking about church hurt, but it doesn't just stay there. So you talk, there's four sections that you talk about in the book and you talk about the hurt, the hard, the hope and the healing. And so I want to go through that just and touch on each of those, but I thought we might start by talking about this concept of deconstruction, because on one hand, there are some people that um, that's where they're at. That's where they're parked. That's, you know, that's their thought process. There are other people that are kind of adjacent to that space. And there are other people that have no idea what it means. They just hear it and they think it's a buzzword and, and they have no real understanding of it. So I thought maybe it would be good for you to kind of talk about that and what that means, especially in the last couple of years. And in terms of Christianity, I think um, both in terms of our relationship with God and what that means in, in terms of the church. Um, because I think sometimes that topic or that word is confusing for some people. Absolutely. And I want to just, you know, as I'm introducing myself to your listeners to tell you all that this ministry started because I was like, why am I still doing ministry? I was in the season of being hurt myself. I was yeah. under narcissistic, toxic leadership in a church where that shouldn't be happening. And yeah. I found myself asking the Lord, like, why do you keep asking me to be in situations that are so harmful and unhealthy. If I've been in this for 40 years, my entire life has been church ministry and I can't seem to find a place where I'm not constantly, you know, getting hurt. Why do you keep asking me to do this? And it was really in that wrestling with that, that the Lord gave me this concept of being raised to stay, which isn't about staying in toxic churches or staying in bad places or abusive places, but rather that John 15 model of abiding in Christ, that when we abide in Christ, that doesn't mean stay in a church, but when we stay in our relationship with Jesus, then we can produce good fruit. And sometimes that good fruit is going to involve having to leave a bad place to either find some healing and look, maybe this will take two or three years for a church where you can really bloom and plant and grow some roots. And I don't think we should rush that process. Right. And I feel the same about deconstruction. 
throughout all of scripture, you see examples of things being torn down. We see in Ecclesiastes that there's a time to build and a time to tear down. In Joshua 1, the Lord is telling Joshua that you're going to go and you're going to plant and you're going to tear down things. And that doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. It can mean that we're going to tear down religion. We're going to tear down a toxic uh, treatment of our congregants and our staff. We're going to not stand for um, and we're going to advocate for those who have been marginalized and set aside. And so when we hear this word deconstruction, I want to challenge the church not to run from that word yeah. or to get defensive. When we hear someone saying that they're deconstructing their faith, because perhaps it's not that they're running away from Jesus, but they're actually tearing down idols in their life. They're tearing down things that have caused them to question if God loves them based off unhealthy religious things that have been placed on top of them. And so I really try hard when someone says that they're deconstructing to ask deep questions. Tell yeah. me your story. Tell me about your life. Tell me about your relationship with Jesus. And not just to let that word scare us or cause us to be defensive, but to lean in and be better listeners as the family of God. Yeah. And, you know, I think churches shy away from having those hard conversations because a lot of times for, for whatever reason, somebody finds themselves in that place or they're having that conversation around deconstruction. Um, there, there's a variety of reasons why that happens. And I think so many churches are afraid of what those answers are instead of facing them head on. Um, it becomes almost like a taboo topic and it, it's really easy to write people off and just say, Oh, well, you know, they're, they're, they're nursing their wounds or whatever it is. But instead, you know, I think what, what we saw in our neighborhood or in our, our community is when the pandemic hit, it really exposed a lot of what was going on behind the scenes. And there were some churches that thrived and there were some churches that fell. And that I think was almost when some of the deconstruction conversations started to get like more people were having that conversation. And I, I found myself like praying through that. Like I wouldn't necessarily say I myself was in a season of deconstructing as far as my faith goes, but I certainly was it's in terms of church leadership, in terms of, is this God, is it, I know I'm called to ministry, but is this really it? Is this where you want me to be? And I think the root of those conversations are powerful because God has to reveal some things before he can heal them in, in our lives, in our churches. And so it's such an important conversation to have. And so I love that you, you know, don't shy away from having that conversation. And how do you see race to stay as part of that ongoing conversation? Like when somebody is finding themselves in that place, what do you think uh, the book race to stay and even your ministry, what do you think that part of the conversation, um, what, what value is there for somebody? Because I think resources is something that is severely lacking in this area. Absolutely. Well, I mean, COVID isolated everyone which means that we were left alone with these deep thoughts. We were left alone to struggle with faith, to sit back and be like, man, I actually don't think that is healthy the way that I'm being treated on this church staff, where we were going and we were just kind of gaslighting ourselves <laughs> into yeah. uh, working and just getting things done. We finally had this moment where we were alone with our thoughts and that was good and bad. Uh, God was healing a little bit. He was revealing, but he was also um, drudging up some things that maybe we didn't realize were toxic. And the enemy had a heyday with our isolation. Yeah. So what I pray is happening now through Raise to Stay is that there is a community that is forming yeah. that is saying, look, I'm, I want to empathize with all, with all of us. We're all going to empathize that yes, church hurt is real. Yes, church abuse is happening. Yes, there are things that we have allowed in the church over the last 30 years that has not been godly, that has not been good, that has not been holy. And together, collectively, we're going to empathize, but we're not going to sympathize. We're not going to say because one person hurt us or five people hurt us even that the whole church is bad, but we're going to collectively come together and we are going to heal together. And then we're going to be agents of change. We are going to say not on our watch. We're not going to let anybody else get hurt. Yeah. We're not going to let anybody else be abused. And when we see something, we're going to say something, even if it costs us our job, we are not going to let anybody else fall victim to abuse. And I think when we get mad at the real enemy, 
-hmm. When we really start to focus our attention on the one who is out to kill, steal, and destroy, that we will get that holy chutzpah in us that will go to church leadership and say, no, this is not okay. And it's not going to happen here. And if I have to, I'll call the police. I'll call the newspapers. I will handle this in a way that you don't want me to handle this if you don't stop abusing people. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Natalie. Stay tuned. The roof was completely gone. All of our memories being wiped away. The rain is what got 20 us. minutes of sheer terror. And you can feel it in your body. I watched the fire move down the canyon. The rumbling of the house. My son started screaming, we're going to die, we're going to die. In the name of Jesus, we are not going to die. At Samaritan's Purse, we bring spiritual and physical aid to hurting people around the world. We go into dangerous situations because in disaster, in disease, in war, Jesus calls us to love our neighbor, to heal the sick, feed the hungry, restore the broken. All who work and volunteer with Samaritan's Purse follow the example of Jesus. We go to serve, not to be served. And we go in Jesus' name. Join us at SamaritansPurse.org. That's SamaritansPurse.org. Hey, everybody. I'm Dale. And I'm Tamara. And we're hosts of the Kynos Project podcast. Where we help you tackle ancient Christian truths in everyday settings. The word Kynos means new, and that's exactly what we want to do on our podcast. Bring something new from what is old in our faith. And on this show, you might hear us explore topics like what the Bible has to say about student loan forgiveness, discuss how the satanic temple affects our view of religious liberty in America, or even question why is it that so many people are having rapture anxiety. To learn more about the podcast, go to lifeaudio.com. Um, and I, that's what I hope Raise the Stay does is that it collectively heals, but also pushes us into change. Yeah. Yeah, I love that because I think that silence is what enables some like we've seen how many mega church pastors fall in the last couple of years. And I kept having this thought, like that didn't happen in a vacuum. There was church staff that's new. You know, I know from being on church staff, like they, there was church staff that knew what was going on and they stayed silent. Now, whatever reason that was, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of manipulation and stuff, but, but I really believe that God is raising up a generation of leaders that are going to say not anymore. Like, like you said, not on my watch. And we need to um, have the strength to be able to have those hard conversations. And that's what I love about Raised to Stay is it's this community of support that is, you know, you feel so isolated even when you're going through those situations, because even, you know, usually when you're on a staff that has some, some abusive uh, toxic stuff going on, um, everybody knows what's going on, but everybody's afraid to say something. And that feels so isolating because like you had said, you know, I, I I gave up my life for this. I moved my family here. This is my ministry is my whole life. How, how would I even survive if I spoke up and got fired over it or, you know, it hit the newspaper because I called the cops or whatever. And so the idea of having community and support around that, I think is, is imperative for us to start changing this conversation. I do want to see if you could explain a little bit though, about the difference between church hurt and church abuse, because I think there is a difference and, you know, they're both they're not that, not to disregard one over another, but there is a difference. So I wondered if you could just kind of unpack that a little bit for us, um, especially for people that might be going through one or the other, how can they tell the difference or what is the difference? Man, the line, it gets blurry. And I'll be honest, I, I try to preface this conversation with, I'm not a professional counselor. You know, my experience is my experience. And um, through the interviews I've done and through being on church staff for the last 20 years and then being a pastor's kid, I do feel that I, I see distinctions between the two. However, church hurt and church abuse, the lines blur a lot once we start getting into narcissistic leadership and mm -hmm. things that start as hurt can easily become abuse if we stay too long. And so there are different definitions. The uh, Biblical uh, Counseling Association calls church hurt. Anytime a leader uses scripture, uh, biblical principles, uh, the Holy Spirit, 
as any type of like a fuel to push us away, to put us down, to cause us to question our calling, to make us feel guilt, shame, doubt, anything like that is church hurt. That's when someone is using the very things that are meant to build the body up to crush us. And this could be anything, you guys. This could be a leader uh, saying something in a meeting. This could be the way that we're treated collectively. I mean, hurt can't really be quantified or even qualified because we all come in with our own baggage and our own experiences. And a lot of times what happened to us as children, even things that happened to us when we were kids in our own biological families can be triggered by things that happen in church families. And it is hurtful, even if it wouldn't be hurtful to somebody else, it's hurtful to us. And so I sit with you in that tension of like, how do I put language to this? Yeah. Abuse comes into a completely different place because this is physical, psychological, sexual, emotional, spiritual. I mean, we're talking about anything that is going to cause us any type of a harm or physical bodily injury. And we've heard these stories through hashtag church too of rape of um, sexual assault, of inappropriate text messages from youth pastors. I mean, we're seeing it, um, affairs with happening within the church. There is so much around that abuse part that, like I said, we can't even say to somebody, you haven't been abused. That's gaslighting. We can't tell people you haven't been abused. And that's why we can't stop these conversations with terminology. Mm -hmm. This is why when somebody comes to us and says, I'm being abused by the church, we can't start trying to like qualify whether or not they've been abused. We have to sit with them in more than one conversation and ask big, hard questions yeah. that will hopefully point them to Jesus and not back to their pain. But we can't stop people from wrestling. We need people to use their words to say what's going on. So we can either shut down abusive churches or we can lead people to healing and say, here's a counselor, here's some spiritual direction. Let's get you healthy and whole again. So you can stay in relationship with Jesus, even if you can't with the church right now. Yeah. And, you know, I think what you said is very true. Like depending on our family of origin and our background and different experiences we've had before we've come to the church, sometimes some of those things, you know, are an indication of some places in your life that need healing. And, the hurt that you're experiencing is just rubbing on a wound. You know, it's like, it's rubbing that open sore wound that might not have hurt so bad if that was whole, you know? And I think there's a big difference, but I also recognize that sometimes one leads to the other, you know, sometimes it starts off as church hurt and it's after being ignored and ignored and ignored and ignored, then it, it leads to church abuse. And so either way, it's important to have these conversations because, um, either way, either need healing or it's time to start pointing some things out that are have otherwise been hidden. Absolutely. And Second Corinthians, Paul is pretty honest. I mean, Paul goes through in Second Corinthians 11, like I've been lost in the wilderness, lost at sea, be beaten by the Roman rods. And at the very end, he says, I've been betrayed by my enemies and I've been betrayed by my brothers. And he's already kind of outlining here that it's going to happen. Like if we yeah. love people, if we go into ministry, if we do this thing, God's called us to do, we're going to get hurt. And even in the, ne the next chapter, he's begging God, like, take this thorn from my flesh, <laughs> like three times mm -hmm. I've asked the Lord to take this away from me. And the Lord keeps responding. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. And so we, we, we know it's going to happen. It's just, I don't want it to keep happening. <laughs> If I'm honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's part of being human for sure. But um, I think there has been, it, it's just so interesting to me because even when you go back and you read about it in scripture or, you know, even some of the things you mentioned are, are what I experienced and uh, talking to women in these situations, a lot of what they experience is what I've experienced. And so what that tells me is that the enemy is behind it. It's, it's some of his tactics to keep people even within the body of Christ bound. And I think it's time to have these conversations to expose the enemy for what he's been doing. Because like you said, he is the real enemy here. You know, it's not that leader. It's not that, I mean, it is, they represent that, um, that role, but it, it it's, goes much deeper than that. And I think it's been hidden for so long because people have been afraid to say anything. 
you know, one of the, the questions I think that a lot of people have is when they're facing these kinds of situations, like, how do you know when to stay or when to leave? And so, you know, what would you say to someone that is either in ministry or maybe they're not necessarily on church staff, but maybe they're a, a ministry leader, like a, you know, a key volunteer, or they're, they're serving in some capacity and they're, they're experiencing some of this, you know, what would you say to them when they're trying to make the decision to stay or to leave? And and the reason why I ask that is because I think for a lot of people, they're, they naturally equate the spiritual leaders in their lives with God. And certainly the man of God, you know, he knows more than I do. Or, you know, if God, God put, I trust God who he's going to put people in leadership that he wants in leadership in my life. And I need to yield to the leadership in my life. And I think because some of those narcissistic leaders know that that's the train of thought, they manipulate that into keeping people around them for far lo- much longer than you would, I think, in a secular situation, if it was just a job or, or something like that, a relationship. So, you know, could you kind of speak to that whole situation? Cause it's so hard to figure out when to leave and when to go. Well, first of all, nobody can tell us, nobody can give us that advice. We, we really do kind of have to make that on our own. And this is where ministry feels lonely, especially if you're single and you don't have a spouse. This is a terrifying position to be in. I've also noticed in our generation that we were taught to respect adults. We were taught that every adult over us, especially a leader who was a Christian leader, a spiritual leader, that they had the final word and that we just needed to obey and submit and do what they said. And I am here to tell you that, yes, we need to honor, but we also need to be honest. And I think a lot of us have um, basically just surrendered to bad leadership, thinking that that's honest. And that's not, we cannot surrender under abusive leaders simply because we're trying to be honoring. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, if you're under that, you need to get out. Anytime you're under an abusive leader, a narcissistic leader, a leader who is hurting you, you have to go. And that's because that is not a safe space. And I would tell this to anybody in a marriage who is in an, an abusive marriage. I would say you have to get out. And I know there's fear attached to that. I know that there is finances attached to that. I know that there is a reputation attached to that, but we cannot stay in those places. When it comes to just being in a bad church and bad leadership, that's when you have to start asking the Lord, do you want me to stay and fight for this? Do you want me to contend for healthy culture? Or is that not my battle to fight? And I've learned that the Lord will give you like this wisdom and the strategy to stay when you're called to stay and fight for something and contend for something and lead in something. And I've had seasons where I've had to stay and I wasn't being abused. I wasn't being hurt. It just was a hard environment. It was a very human environment. But even in this last church that I was at, it came down to a point where I had to ask myself, like, am I here to partner with them? Or is this something where the Lord is giving me freedom to go? And there's beauty and the Lord releasing us. I also want to tell you that God's not in heaven saying, oh my gosh, what are they doing? I had no idea they were going to leave that church, or I had no idea they were going to leave that position. God is not caught off guard by anything that we do. And even if we make the wrong decision, do we believe that God is good enough to cover us and to continue to bless us and move us on? There's so much freedom in the Lord. And so we don't have to stay anywhere if we don't want to. And that's just the beauty. And my husband and I, we wrestle with this a lot. And in this last church I was in, I really wanted to quit. It was in a season of high abuse and we were standing in the kitchen and I said to him, I said, I just want to move back. I don't want to keep doing this anymore. This is too painful. It's too familiar. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes and he's about six, three and in like two seventy. <laughs> he's not a small man. And uh, he had big tears in his eyes. And he said, Natalie, if it's time to go, we'll go. He said, but if it's time to, for us to stay and contend, we have to ask ourselves this question. Do we trust that the same Holy Spirit that is leading and guiding us every single day is leading and guiding the leadership that is over us as a whole? Maybe not the leader who's abusing you, but the leadership who is over the entire church. Do you believe that they're hearing from the Lord? And I said, I I do. I do believe that. And I did. And he said, then let's stay and figure out why God brought us here. And as soon as that leader was exposed, the leader who was abusing me, they fired her. They got rid of her. It was done. And we saw for ourselves that the overall church was healthy. It was just this one leader who wasn't. And I think that the Lord called us in that moment to contend for that. Mm -hmm. But there 
the church before that, we had to run for our lives. So you can see that it's all, it's very case by case. Yeah. Um, and asking mentors and leaders to speak into that, don't try to make the decision totally on your own. If you don't have to go to a counselor, go to someone and ask for wise counsel as you're processing that. Yeah. That's so, so valuable. Why do you think this is so common? I wish I knew it's, it's maddening. Um, my Instagram account, I, I try to, if you notice in my black boxes, which I write black boxes with white writing, I try to have a balanced view on everything. So I'll kind of uh, defend those who have been abused and then I'll defend the church or I'll defend, you know, I try to give like these counter perspectives to everything so that I'm not heavy on one side. And I get, I get taken out by more religious people than I do by people who are wrestling with their faith. Um, because I believe that the religious spirit does not want to be confronted. Yeah. And that's a spiritual thing. Like even this conversation, the enemy does not want us having this conversation. Yeah. So I'm not surprised when there's glitches and things that happen on these podcasts because we're exposing sin. We're exposing um, things that are hurting the people of God. And we know what happens when people hurt the people of God. Yeah. God yeah. does not let that happen. And so these conversations are the things that are opening up Pandora's box and the church and leaders don't want to admit they're part of the problem. Pastors do not want to admit that they've hurt people but we are human and we're going to hurt people. And if we could just repent, if we could just be honest, when we've hurt each other, there would be so much healing that would happen within those four walls of the church. But so much pride mm -hmm. is stopping us from saying, you're right. I'm wrong. Yeah. Like how easy is it to just say those things and to open up the dialogue, but people want to build their platforms. They do not want to confess when they've been bad or wrong. Yeah. Well, I think in general, that idea of confession in the church has like, been hidden in the last couple of years. And we, on the podcast, we did a spiritual discipline series where we spent a week talking about confession. I'm like, why isn't this built into the rhythms of our spiritual lives? Like it's, you have to be really intentional and uncomfortable to seek out opportunities for confession. And I'm like, what, this is part of our problem. You know, as leaders, we need to be setting the tone for having these kinds of conversations, but it's so difficult to get church leadership to even engage in that conversation. Um, and, and I think, too, you know, we're talking about narcissistic leaders. I, I can't remember where it was on the list, but I know that being a pastor was in one of the top 10 professions for narcissists. Like it was like surgeons and pastors and principals and, you know, those kinds of authoritative kind of roles. And so I've often wondered about that too. Like if that is a profession that attracts people that struggle with that, that kind of personality, because there is opportunity there, there's opportunity for them to gain power. And um, it just, it surprises me how common it is and how, when I start talking with women about it, how the things they are saying are the things that I've already said, or the thoughts that I've had, or, you know, there are just a few books that I have read in the last couple of years where I'm like, were they sitting in our staff meetings? Like literally it sounds word for word, like some of the stuff, some of the conversations we've had. So it's super interesting to me. I I want you to kind of unpack and talk about two phrases that you talk about in the book. You talk about the hurt and the hard and then the hope and the holy. Could you kind of unpack that for us a little bit? I feel like most of my life I've lived in the hurt and the hard, if I'm honest, um, because getting to the hope and the holy requires this like digging in and refusing to let the enemy win, but it's exhausting. Yeah. And there is a part where it's just easier to tap out than to keep going. And when you're called to it, like you said earlier, when you're called to it, you can't ignore it. Um, you can't run from it and you can run, but you can't hide because the Lord will wake you up with dreams and books and podcasts to help carry his message, not ours. Yeah. And so when we get to this, you know, hope in the holy, it's really sitting in the presence of God and saying, Humans are human, man is man, but you are God. And if you promise me in the word so many promises, and your promises are yes and amen, one of those promises, Philippians 1 6, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it to the very end, then I I'm willing, through the power and only through the power of the Holy Spirit, to sit in this tension and to see what you have that you want to finish in me. 
And I would say, if I'm truly honest, that I have not seen the hope and the holy until the last three years of my life. Mm -hmm. And I've seen glimpses of it. I've seen it through other people's stories. I've read about it. But when I really came to this place was about two summers ago, I was asked to come lead worship for the church that hurt my parents the most when I was in high school. And I said, no, because I had been through counseling and I've had medication. And why would I go back (laughs) into that? Why would I go back into that again? But the Lord said, you know, you're writing a book about a reconciled church. Maybe you should go back to where it all began. And Mm -hmm. so I went ahead and got on a plane and I flew home and I walked into that church with a knot in my stomach. And if you've been hurt by the church, you know what that feels like, like you're going to puke just being in the space. And I walked in and walked into the sanctuary and there were people who were actively part of that exit that had hurt my family so bad that I write about in the book. And, um, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I felt like the, the black sheep of this family. And I walk in and people who I thought were in their eighties when I was 18 clearly weren't because they're still alive and they're sitting in their pews, you know, and Mm -hmm. same place as they always sat. And, um, we get up there, we start practicing and everything's fine. And we get to the part of the service where the pastor introduces each of us on the platform. And when we were part of the church, cause it's this 100 year anniversary and he gets to me and he had been in my youth group at the time that the, ch- that we had gone through our church hurt. And now he's the pastor and he gets to me and he says, this is Natalie. Her father was one of our favorite pastors to ever pastor this church. And the whole church goes up in this o- standing ovation for my dad who I thought they had hated us. Like I thought we had been put in exile for 25 years. I thought that this was my story, that the hurt and the hard was going to follow me. And I realized in that moment that the enemy had taken all of that offense and all of that pain. And he he had built it up over the years to make me think that this whole experience was going to define me. But in this one moment, there was this healing and this holiness of a reconciled church. And I started weeping on the platform and I got down and all the old ladies are coming up to me and they're holding my face and they're saying, you look just like your daddy and tell your mom that we miss her singing and that your daddy was my favorite hunting buddy. And there was just this restoration that happened right before my eyes at 41 years old. And I thought, oh my goodness, if I would have quit, I would have never seen this moment of full healing. And it took me 41 years to see it. It took, it took my entire life Uh, to see this moment. And so that's when I came into contact for the first time with this hope um, and the holiness of a God who does fulfill every promise that he makes to us. But if we quit, we won't get to see the hope and the holy will remain in that hurt and the hard. And I don't want us to stay there. I know we have to experience it and I know we have to deal with it. Um, But I believe that there is a hope and a holy if we just hold on. Oh, I love that. That's such a powerful message of redemption, how God can redeem all of those broken and hurting places. I love that so much. Well, Natalie, I was wondering if you would be willing to pray for our listeners today and specifically pray for that woman that is going through church hurt right now in whatever capacity, whether it's church hurt or church abuse or just the tension of maybe even those beginning stages where you you don't know exactly what to call it, but you know something doesn't feel right. You know, there's that discernment that's kicking in, but you don't even know how to think about it. You know, if you could pray for that woman, and I think um, you have provided such an excellent resource for people that are going through any of those stages. And I'm, I'm excited for what God is gonna do through these really difficult conversations. And I just wanna say thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you for writing this book. Thank you for stepping into this space. I think it, is um, a powerful conversation that it's it's we're having this conversation whether it's just between us and God or you know other staff that are going through it um, it's a conversation that I think God is pushing out into the open and um, we're we're going to be praying for you and for your ministry Thank that you. as things get exposed that you would just have a shield of protection around you that um these conversations that people are having would bring freedom in a lot of different areas. And so I just want to say thank you. And then ask if you would just um, pray for our listeners that, that are just in a hard space right now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's pray guys. Oh, father, I thank you for your daughters. God, you have given us a voice Lord that is known for bringing good news 
Lord, the women who found that you had risen, Lord, they were the first to declare that, God. And so we step into that uh, responsibility, Lord, to be a voice, God, that declares truth, God, that declares good news. I thank you that you've given us discernment that has oftentimes been called suspicious by people that don't understand what we're seeing, God. But I thank you for the discernment that you have given us to be able to walk into spaces and to know when something's not right, to know when a person is not okay, God, and that you have wired us, Lord, to advocate and to fight for the body of Christ. Lord, I pray for every woman who's been told that they're too much or not enough or that they're a Jezebel. God, I I rebuke those lies that have been spoken over your daughters. God, that when they've tried to advocate for truth, Lord, they've been silenced. When they've tried to advocate for health, they've been silenced, Lord. I pray, God, for our eyes to be opened even more to the things that you're doing in your church. God, I pray for you, God, to give us just dreams and visions and scriptures, Lord, to back up what we're seeing. And that as we step into churches, Lord, and we're asked to be with your people, to lead your people, to stay with your people, God, that we would know that you've equipped us for this season, that we have everything we need to carry the thing that you've asked us to carry, and that we are not a mistake. You did not forget to make us a man. You have made us a woman on purpose. And so as we step into churches, as we step into ministries and organizations, God, I pray that we would walk with boldness and confidence and authority to do the thing you've asked us to do unapologetically. God, I pray that we would be bold enough to speak up when we see abuse, that we would be uh, wise enough to know as a serpent, just wise as a serpent, yet gentle as a dove to be able to say the things that need to be said, Lord, and that if we need to be an Esther, that we'll be an Esther. And if we need to be a Hannah, we'll be a Hannah. And if we need to be an, uh, whoever it is that you need us to be, Lord, an Anna, that we will sit in intercession and we won't get up until you have told us it's time. And I just ask, Lord, for activation now across this entire world of women who will go and do the thing you've asked us to do and to do it with reckless abandonment and passion and fire and fury. God, as we go and we declare the good news, Lord, And we go and we make disciples and we do it with just a total and complete love for you and your people. Heal the hearts of those who have been wounded. Bind up those wounds, Lord. Don't let them stop us from the thing you've called us to do. I pray for rest for those who need rest. I pray for those who are walking out forgiveness right now that you would give them supernatural grace to do so. God, and I pray, Lord, that if people need to just take a breath, God, if they just need to take a beat for a second, God, that you would meet them wherever they are and remind them that you are wherever they are, God, and it doesn't have to be in a building, that you're meeting with them even now. Thank you for that promise that you never leave us or forsake us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Natalie, for coming on the show and for having this conversation. Um, can you share with our listeners how they can find you and how could they can get their hands on a copy of this book? I would love for you guys to be part of all of our communities online. Raise to Stay is on Instagram as well as Facebook. We have a couple public accounts under Natalie Runyon, R-U-N-I-O-N. And then also um, a couple of them under Raise to Stay that are more for people to meet and talk in private so it's not so public. Um, Yeah, and then the book comes out July 4th, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. We are trying to see this book hit some massive records right now because I just want to kick the devil in the face. So if you'd like to pre-order, that would always help us as well. Um, Actually, I think you might be able to get it now. So go help us uh, get a book out. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm really excited for women to get their hands on a copy of this book. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Rachel. I know you've been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. Listen, I know I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, which helps you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I include lots of cultural and historical information, and it really makes these familiar passages of scripture just come alive. This is a great study to do on your own, to do with some girlfriends or even some teenage girls, and it will help you really gain the confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. You can find that on my resources page at shehears.org, where there are also some really good resources to help you in your spiritual growth. I pray that they are a blessing for you. 
I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His. The United States Border Patrol has exciting and rewarding career opportunities with the nation's largest law enforcement organization. Border Patrol agents enjoy great pay, outstanding federal benefits, and up to $20,000 in recruitment incentives. If you are looking for a way to serve something greater than yourself, consider the U.S. Border Patrol. Learn more online at cbp.gov slash careers slash USBP. That's cbp.gov slash careers slash USBP.